You are listening to Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Hey, everybody out there. I managed to get Paul Solomon to be a co-host again. I called up Ma. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, uh, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. If you want to um, send us an email, you can get us at rescuemedia at juno.com. If you want to go to our website, it's tcbradio.com. And we got an actually a super cool guest uh, today. Um, I'm an author. Everybody knows my book, Winning in the New York Small Claims Courts. And uh, I like to do shameless plugs. But when I meet people who actually write really cool books, um, such as uh, Stuart Miller, uh, who's with us today, and we, we were kind enough to grab him and, and spend some time with him, um, he's, he's written a, a number of different books on a number of different topics. And um, one of the books I'm actually holding in my hands is a book called The Other Islands of New York City. I remember a joke, maybe it was on Bugs Bunny, and they were talking about the islands of New York, and they were talking about like (laughs) Rikers Island, Coney Island, and things (laughs) like that. But he talks about all of these islands um, in New York. It's a really cool book. It's about, you know, 280 pages, and it has a tremendous history of New York. And and, and I got to ask you, as 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 a New Yorker, what what was the inspiration for this book, and what were the great things that you learned about New York and its islands in researching this book? Okay, but first let me say that Rikers and Coney are both in there, too. No, no, that's as, the funny as, thing. As, as a tribute to Bugs Bunny. <laughs> um, yeah, well, the inspiration for it was that um, the, my co-author on this book, Sharon Seitz, who is now my wife, we, we met ah, at... Ah, there you go. Um, we, we met at journalism school, and she wrote her master's about an island out in... Uh, Queens called Broad Channel, and she, I, it was, she won an award for it at Columbia and everything. Two years later, we were at Ellis Island with my family, and we somehow just started talking about, oh, well, the different islands, and, you know, wow, we should write an article about it. We started looking into it, and so, wow, there's more islands than we thought. Um, if you count islands that used to be islands, you know, I mean, Coney Island's not an island anymore, um, and so we should write a book, and so it turned into a book, and we actually um, ironically then broke up wrote the book while we were broken up, and then the day the book came out, decided to get back together. And so the book actually has, you know, has this happy ending of we get back together and now we're married and have two kids. And we've since written another book together called The Blue Guide to New York, um, which is like a 700-page walking tour of every neighborhood in the city. But as far as what I, we learned from um, that, I mean, it, it was, the thing about the other islands of New York that was great is that there were so many... Places, I mean, these places that I'd never heard of that have these wild stories. I mean, there's Hoffman and Swinburne Island, which were these quarantine islands for immigrants. There's uh, my favorite was North Brother Island, which is where Typhoid Mary was held for the last 23 years of her life. Um, you know, it was, uh, again, another quarantine island. It's in the, um, the East River, quite near Rikers Island, actually. Um, it was later on, it was where, it was also where the, um, the General Slocum fire, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but this was before the Titanic, about eight years, and it was equally disastrous. Some 1,300 people on it died, but because they were immigrants um, and they were all poor, you know, from the Lower East Side, people don't remember it the way the Titanic, you know, which of course had a lot of rich people on it. Um, but it was, you know, an equally horrific and dramatic story. Um, later on in the 50s and 60s, there was a juvenile drug rehabilitation center there um, that eventually um, was it was very poorly run, but eventually inspired a short-lived Broadway play. Is most notable for giving, being the Broadway debut of Al Pacino. So Al Pacino can trace his success as an actor directly back to one of New York City's islands. That's why. Now, yeah. Florida has Boca Raton, which means rat's mouth, and we actually have a rat island in the Bronx. Yeah. What, what's the story of Rat Island? And and isn't a lot of New York Rat Island? But it's, uh, you know, Rat Island is this, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of these tiny little islands. Um, near where City Island is. You know, the, the more interesting islands in the Bronx are City Island and Hart Island, which is where the Potter's Field is. And in between the two are these, or around the two are these little islands, like Rat Island. And there's one called Cuban Ledge, and there, there are these two called East and South No Nations, which are named because, you know, no nations decided they were worth fighting over way back when, when these things used to be all matters of dispute. You know, so there's a, Rat Island was probably named that because, you know, there were rats on it once, but there's not much more. It doesn't have a great and lustrous history to it. Now, I remember fishing off of City Island. There's a whole bunch of little fishing boats um, that I remember going off of. And I remember one of the fishing boat captains talked about um, 
there were islands that they had military vehicles and things like that on. They said if you actually go there, there'll be jeeps and things that were abandoned from World War II. Do you know anything about that? Mm. Or munitions uh, islands or munitions holding islands? I mean, well, Heart Island had a, had a Nike missile air base. Um, wow. Nuclear? Um, was that nuclear? No, but I think it was a long-range missile. There, there were a whole ring of them around the city to protect the city in the, during the Cold War. Um, there was a lot of other abandoned stuff. There were more old paperwork. Uh, the Merchant Marines were on Hoffman and Swinburne Island, but that stuff was all gone. There was, there was obviously the, the Army was on Governor's Island. I mean, people were being processed in and out of, you know, for World War One and World War Two in and out of Governor's Island, but it wasn't abandoned at any point in our lifetime until the last, you know, 10 years when the Coast Guard left. So I'm not quite sure what he's talking about. I will say that, that a lot of these islands, there are a lot of stories and myths about them, and people, you know, do that. They make stuff up. Oh, yeah, I've heard that one of these islands had, you know, the ghost of so-and-so. You know, I mean, and we we found even in articles written about stuff that perpetuated myths, you know, for hundreds of years, and, and then you'd go back and dig up the original sources and find that they were... Not true. Good for tourism. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you, you mentioned the word Potter's Field. And for the people, this is a, inner, this is a show that broadcasts both on um, you know, terrestrial radio as well as over the Internet. Um, for those outside of the New York area, they may have heard about Potter's Field. Talk about that. And- well, that's a, yeah, it's not new, unique to New York. I mean, I think that, that that's a, a common thing, that the Potter's Field is, is a biblical phrase. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's where you bury, people always think of it actually as the place where you bury the John and Jane Doe's, but it's really not that. It's where, where the indigent poor, you know, are buried, people who can't afford, um, a funeral. So if somebody dies, let's say, in a new, in a public hospital, and there's nobody to clean the body, or, or somebody dies in their apartment, but the family can't afford a funeral, they end up in, in a potter's field. The city marks each spot, and, you know, I mean, you can go up to a few years later, you can go, Say, hey, my family raised the money. We'd like to disinter the body. You know, it's in a plain pine coffin. It may be partially decomposed or whatever. But the city will go in and get it for you, and you can bury it wherever, you know, your family's plot is or whatever. Right. You know, it's interesting because I was listening to um, NPR the other day, and there's a show called Fresh Air, and there's a gentleman um, talking about cemeteries, and he was talking about how there's like a new push for something called natural cemeteries where you like basically get buried in the forest and it's a little bit more natural and you kind of get returned to the earth and right it was you know. on six feet under you ever watch six feet under a little bit a little bit you know that that was at the end of the show that's what you know happened that's kind of was one of the trends on that show and the, a couple of the main characters that was the way they were one war or wanted to be buried was that way just kind of like in a burlap sack in, in the middle of nowhere kind of thing well yeah and, you know in the jewish faith they pretty much like in Israel and, and other places, right. you know, you're supposed to be buried within 24 hours. Uh, there's no embalming or anything like that. Right. They kind of just put you right in and you're supposed to kind of re- return. To the earth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But on, on happier other topics, yes. um, this this must have been a fun book, The the, the Other Islands of New York, A, a Historical Companion, uh, with your co-author and now wife, uh, Sharon. Uh, this must have been a really fun book to write. It just seems like it was fun to write, like real exploration. In fact... Uh, Mario Cuomo has a little quote on the back. Did you actually get to meet him? No, no. I sent him a copy of the book and a letter, and he, you know, saying, you know, "Would you want to give us a quote from the back of the book?" Kind of thing. That's very gracious of him because yeah. you know, usually when I ask for quotes, you know, I get the you know, you know it gets thrown into the circular file. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've had you know relatively good. I mean, you know, with my new book, with the hundred greatest days in New York sports, I was able to get Tom Seaver to do the forward. I mean, the difference there, I guess, is that. When I called up his agent, he said, "Sure, for, you know, how about five thousand dollars?" And then doing it for four thousand dollars. <laughs> Whereas Mario Cuomo, at least, just kind of did this out of the goodness of his heart. Well, what I'd like to mention to our studio audience is a picture of you as a child with Tom Seaver. That's uh, in the forward, which I think is quite capturing. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, yeah, the other islands was a fun book to write, but the new book was also obviously, in a way, more fun to write because, you know, growing up as a kid, if somebody said to me, you know, right, you're never going to be a major league baseball player. But, you know, but all this time that you spent sitting looking at the baseball encyclopedia or playing out but baseball or reading your, your books, you know, this is going to translate into this is what you'll do for a living. You'll get to write a book about sports um, like this. You know, I would have said, wow, that's fantastic. And then, you know, I met Tom Seaver, you know, I went to this Welcome Home Mets dinner in 1974 when I was eight eight years old and, you know, 
we, uh, you know, I wore my Mets uniform, and my, you know, my parents took a, a picture of me. You know, remember those flat, um, instamatic cameras with those stack flash. Bowls? The cubes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 oh yeah. So like the worst crummiest picture. You know, I'm like half out of the frame and it's badly focused, and and yet all of a sudden now this like you know 30 years later came in handy because I got to put it in a book. You know, with of me and Tom Seaver to kind of link his forward to my book. It was kind of a really a great great thing for me. Was it? What was the number on your uniform? Was it Tom's number? No, he he was my favorite player, but I, I, I'm lefty, so I felt that it wouldn't make sense to have his number. This is one of these weird, you know, kid rationalizations. So I had 45. I had Tug McGraw's number. Ah, you gotta believe. <laughs> yeah, you know exactly. It seemed. It seemed like, as far as the second choice go, and I could, as a lefty, I could have chosen Kuzman or Matlack as well, but I, I, I always loved McGraw. So like, I, I got to ask you: Do you ever do any of the baseball fantasy camps, you know, and stuff like that? I never have. I've always thought about it, but it also seems kind of expensive. So maybe you could do a book signing there. <laughs> <laughs> that would actually probably be a great idea. Yeah, I'd do a little book signing. Um, so let's talk about this book. I'm holding in my hands a giant book here. It's called "The Hundred Greatest Days in New York Sports." By Stuart Miller. This this book looks like it was a tremendous effort. Um, it's got photos. It's gigantic. It's got great um, you know quality to it. Um, it, it it's really it's, it's. How long did this take you to write? It took about a, a year and a half, all told. You know, with a lot of sleepless nights in there. But yeah, it's funny. I mean, it was supposed to be a three hundred and fifty page book when they signed the contract, and I ended up writing five hundred. 25 pages, and actually, there's more. I have a website, 100greatestnysports.com, and there's a section there called Cutting Room Floor because there's all the stuff that I finally had to take out so it didn't become 600 pages, um, mostly kind of from the worst moments of the back of the book stuff. Uh, you know, and I, I put all that on the website. And, you know, it's funny because um, Yankee fans never bother to ask about the worst moments, but Met fans and Brooklyn Dodger fans and, and Nick fans always are like, oh, do you have the Charles Smith moment or do you have, you know, um, the Mets blowing this, or you know, and so there's a lot of oh, and Ranger fans, obviously as well. Um, now, do you have do you happen to have like in your house like some old seats from Madison Square Garden or from Evansville? No, I don't have a lot of that. I did, you know, it's funny. My I turned forty th- this past year, you know, in, in last year, and you know, and the book was coming out. So my dad was like, "Oh, do you want something you know, special for your birthday, fortieth birthday?" I wanted to get something that was somehow connected to. The book, and I thought of maybe doing some, getting some Tom Seaver thing, but I actually found there, there, I found a there's a great an autographed, you know, large twenty by twenty four photo autographed photo of Willie Mays making the catch, and I always loved Willie Mays when I was a kid. I used to read his biography over and over. And the, the say hey kid, and you know, and the catch is one of, in my top fifteen events, and you know, so I just saw it, so that's my my one great bit of memorabilia. I mean, somewhere tucked away, I've got my. Um, you know the, the program from that Welcome Home Mets dinner, and I met all the Knicks in the, after their seventy two seventy three championship. But I don't have any seats from Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. I have a, a foul ball that Steve Trassel hit uh, two years ago. Well, that's <laughs> kind of cool. I'll tell you, I'll tell you an interesting story. When I was a little boy, um, I went with my parents to Florida to Miami, and in the airport, my mother spotted Jackie Robinson, and wow. she bought a comic book. It was like an Archie comic book, and this is like in the 1960s. Right. She she like went up to the thing, like gave the guy a quarter, got an Archie comic book, and he signed his name on it. And somewhere we had that, you know. And it was really cool because, um, you know, I you know it was a little, it was a great little interaction, um, right. and stuff like that. So let's talk. What what of the hundred greatest days in New York sports? Were there any days that you were actually present that you witnessed as a live human being as opposed to a historian? Yes, um, I mean, and, there, and you know, I also have. A, there's also a hundred honorable mention in here as well, and so there were a few of those. Um, I I was at um, Lenny Dykstra hitting the home run in um, Game Three of the 1986 uh, World Series. And, no, the NLCS against yeah. against Houston. I was there for that. Um, was, I, that was that cool or what? That was fantastic. I was also there at Game Five. And Carter hit the single up the middle. Now that's in the honorable mention. It didn't make the top 100. Um, and I was, you know, there are somewhere I was, I, I was there. There's one in, down in the near the bottom of the top 100 for when uh, I um, Martina Navratilova and Steffi Graf, and then 
Monica Seles and Jennifer Capriati had this kind of powerhouse day at the U.S. Open in the women's semifinals. And Seles and Capriati kind of really introduced power tennis to women that day. And I was there for that. I was there for the first game of the Brooklyn Cyclones, you know, baseball return to Brooklyn. I was supposed to be at the first post-9-11 game at Shea when Piazza hit the home run, but my wife went away for the weekend and I had to watch my kids. <laughs> so I, uh, I missed that one. But I, ha- I had a ticket for it. Um, you know, there there were other ones that, um, of, of most of those other ones, I, I was not there when Carl Hubble struck out five in a row in the All-Star game in 1934 or anything like that. You know, I mean, so much of this stuff is history. I, w- I was at one of the games in the NBA Finals, but I was not at any of the, in, in 94, but I was not at um, any of the games against Indiana, which is, you know, game seven there when Ewing finally lifted the Knicks into the finals, is what made my list. That's number 33. Well, one, one personal note for Paul and I. Um, by the way, this is Taking Care of Business, and today we're really talking about sports uh, with Stuart Miller, and I was lucky enough to get Paul Solomon here to be my co-host. And you can catch us on tcbradio.com in the archive section. So if you're catching the show and you have a sports nut in your family, uh, go to the archives and pull this show up and, and, and share these great moments uh, well in New York sports ch- history. As well as checking out the author's website, which is? Do you have a website? 100greatestnysports.com. There you go. And, and, then, course- and let me just say, there's, there's a way, not only can you obviously you can kind of click on there and get sent over to Amazon to buy the book, but there's a way to click on there to email me if you want to argue, you know, here's, <laughs> you know, what I think should have been number five or what I think should have been, you know, how could you have left this off? Or, and I'll post it on the website, or if you email me and say, hey, here's my greatest moments of the games that I was at or the worst moments of the games that I was at. I have a whole thing there. I can put up your personal reminiscences. And what's your email? Um, you can just click on the website that says Contact Stuart, and, and it'll take you right to me. Well, okay. so you, don't, you, know, you don't have to worry about jotting it down right now. Perfect. Now, one thing that Paul and I witnessed, we actually saw in the playoffs when the Rangers finally had their big 1994 win, um, after so many so many years of hearing 1940, <laughs> right, right. We, we were there in the playoffs. There's a story be- behind that. Uh, I was playing hooky from work when they announced Ticketron and the Ticketmaster announced that tickets were to become available for the fifth game of the right. Ra- Rangers Washington series because the Rangers lost the night before. And so I snuck out of my office, <laughs> ran to Madison Square Garden, managed to call Richie. He didn't have a pager then, so I just kept calling him in his office. I said, I'm getting tickets for this game. And we managed to get tickets to the Rangers-Washington game where the Rangers beat Washington and eventually went to the Stanley Cup Finals. i, I got to ask you a question about Lou Gehrig because sure. one of the things that you always see, and this is definitely in your book, and if you go visit the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, which is probably a very cool place uh, to catch some of the 100 greatest moments, right. you know, that they, they, you see in movies, you see in the uh, Hall of Fame, you see the Lou Gehrig, uh, you know, I'm the luckiest man. And, of course, you know, it's a little ironic that a man who's dying of a horrible disease calls himself the luckiest man. Um, could you talk about that as a historian and, and what you kind of, like, felt as someone looking at it from – you know, in the future, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, well, what's interesting about it is, you know, you talk about the irony there. Most people did not know that he was dying. They knew that he was sick and that he had been forced to retire. But Gehrig, partially because he was, you know, he was a very modest guy, and he he didn't want all this, this attention. He didn't want this day in his honor. He didn't want to have to give a speech. And he certainly didn't want the sympathy or the pity of anybody. So he had just gone to the Mayo Clinic, and he knew. But he didn't really tell people so, you know, his wife may have known at that point, may not have known. Um, Ed Barrow, who ran the Yankees, who had known Gehrig for a long time, found out, I think, soon after. But most people did not know he was dying. So in that moment, when he gave that speech, and he's talking about being the luckiest man on the face of the earth, people, you know, it, it was moving, but I don't think it kind of carried that same weight when you, when you look back and you know how much grace and kind of courage, and again, those are words you hear thrown a lot, around a lot of cliches in the sports world, but how much grace and courage it really had to take to get up there and and talk about being thankful for all that you've had and all that you've been able to experience. It's true. It, in the face of the fact that you are going to lose your mobility and then you're in a slow and painful way, and then you're going to die. And he may not have known that it was going to be two years. I mean, look, there are people 
with ALS who live for, for 10, 15 years. But even so, you're, you, they end up in wheelchair. I mean, it's a terrible disease, um, even if you don't die so quickly. So he, had, he was the only one that really had a full sense of that. And so for him to find the, the, the way to express that, the ability to express it the way he did, is, is really um, wonderful and powerful. And I think that's kind of why it resonates. And it's, um, you know, and it's great because Garrick really, look, I mean, he was this classic. He was, he's from New York, one of the few New York stars who's from New York. You know, he went to Columbia, you know, he grew up on the Lower East Side. I mean, the classic American dream story, right? You, you grow up on the Lower East Side with immigrant parents, and they always tell you, if you work hard, you know, you'll make something of yourself. Well, who worked harder than the guy who came to play every day for 2,130 straight games? So, therefore, it's also you know, ultimately, even more ironic, that who would be felled by this disease that would, you know, so so debilitate him than than that guy who put everything on the line in that way. And so, you know, with, when you when you layer all that on, and then you look back on it, you know, the, the speech is just magnificent. And, and you know, the thing that's kind of interesting is, um, you, you know, you see the 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 view play the, the 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 replays of it in black and white, and it really makes it that much more. Um, historic thing. looking. Yeah, it's yeah. all right. It's one of these things that in, in our head, right? I mean, I, obviously none of us, a lot, you know, most of the people alive right now weren't, weren't there, but it's it's one of these moments that seems to have existed in black and white. It has that sort of feel to it. And it's, you know, it's funny because that's number three on my list, and that was one that I, I really had a hard time with. I mean, at one point I had a really low down in the list, in the, like in the 70s, because I was thinking, well, it's not a sporting event. You know, it was a speech and then I had it in the 20s, and then I had it in the top 10, but, I, but it kind of yo-yoed all over the place before I finally really kind of, as I sorted out my criteria, it ended up at, at number three on the list. Well, we, we can't forget the World Series of 1969 because I was in, like, fourth grade. <laughs> and what was kind of interesting is the New York City uh, school that I went to actually had something very interesting. They suspended kind of class content brought in TVs, and we actually watched the World Series from inside the classroom, which was kind of an amazing thing, which you would never see today, especially with the age of, you know, DVRs and things like that. Right, but, but, but not just with the age of DVRs. It's also that there was an innocence to, the, to that team. To the, I mean, there was a sense of wonder with that Mets team, um, just as there had been with the Jets, but, but um, even more so with the Mets because, you know, the Mets kind of came into, you know, with the Dodgers – in their years before they left, and the Giants had been these great ball clubs, and then the Mets came in and were the height of ineptitude, or the little depths of ineptitude. I mean, you know, losing 120 in their first year, and they were they were just an awful, awful team, and so and they were a joke. I mean, you know, they were just you know now when the Mets have bad years or the Yankees have bad years, it's frustrating because they're these you know they have these huge payrolls and blah blah blah. But back then, this was they were comic relief, and then all of a sudden, in a year, in a space of practically a year and a half. They turned themselves around, and so that World Series had a magical feel to it. And in fact, I mean, there are three games from that World Series in the top 100. Um, I went with you know number nine, the highest ranked one of those three is um, is the is the is the clinchers game five, not because it was the most dramatic game, but because it was it was the one that kind of finished it off. It was that moment that wow, all of a sudden the Mets are world champions. Um, and actually, the the one that's ranked in the 40s, which is the next highest one, is is was a, has Tommy Agee's two great catches. I remember I have his baseball yeah. card. <laughs> and and you know the thing about that is the, those catches were fantastic. Um, but it was also more that that was the first World Series game at Shea, and the Mets had split in Baltimore. So you know they could, if they had lost that game, they would have really been. Um, in big, you know, they could have been in big trouble because they, they could have lost their confidence. They would have been down two games to one, uh, you know, et cetera. So that game was was pretty crucial. I actually think the game four, which I have ranked much lower down in the seventies or eighties, um, is the best game, is the most exciting game of the bunch. But it had the least significance because the Mets were already up two games to one, and you know, so even if they had lost this game, they probably, you know, they could have bounced back. So, it, but. That's the game that Seaver went out and pitched ten, 10 innings. But in the ninth inning, with a one nothing lead, you know the Orioles got a man on base, and then there's the sinking line drive to right field and Swoboda, who of course is not Tommy Agee by any stretch of the imagination. You know who's more of a Marv Thornberry when it comes to defense, 
makes this incredible dive and catch and saves the day. And then in the bottom of the 10th inning, they get this play where J.C. Martin, who in his only World Series at bat, bunts the ball and you know with a man on base and runs out of the baseline. But the Orioles, you know, don't protest it. But um, the throw ricochets off his wrist and into right field. It's one of those classic, you know, the Mets find those Mets found a way to win. And and it's interesting because every every year since then the Mets have been good. They've kind of had that um, as a benchmark. As a benchmark, that that idea of. He's got, you know, I mean, look, the 86 Mets, like, I mean, we talked about the Dykstra game, but even more so, obviously, game six of the World Series. I mean, that, to talk about you're, you're finding a way to win. You know, and all, all year that year, they had these crazy games where, you know, there was a game where they had a double play to end the game where they a fly ball to left, um, threw the guy out of the plate, and then and threw back down to third base for, for a double play. It was like a weird double play. They had, you know, a brawl. And, you know, they, they had this play with Dave Parker dropped a fly ball in the ninth inning with two outs, and then that game went to extra innings. The Mets had to, like, use Jesse Orozco and Roger McDowell in the outfield. You know, but they would win those games. And that's always been the benchmark. You know, the Robin Ventura Grand Slam single, which I have in the book. I mean, they had some of the most bizarre and memorable games when, when they've been good. Wow, where does where does your love? I mean, you could just tell that you just love sports. Where, where does that come from? And, and who in your family were also sports lovers? Well, you know, it's and how much of this it has to be like just being a kid in New York and growing up at the right time. Well, I, but see, I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was the right time. I mean, I grew up, you know, I mean, my first, I guess, when I was really, I guess, in some of the formative years, formative single year, seventy three. First year, I really paid attention to sports in any meaningful way. The Knicks won the championship that May, and the Mets went to the World Series. So that's pretty exciting. Well, on the other hand, the, Mets, the Knicks then didn't make it to the finals till I was an adult again, you know, and the Mets didn't make it to the World Series until I was 20 years old, you know. So, and the Giants of my youth and the Jets of my youth, I mean, the, when they played in New York. <laughs> well, they, they'd already, the Giants had already, were, were in the process of leaving right then. You know, right, and the Jets were still there, and the Jets were bad, and the Giants were worse. You know, and I was never, I was never really a hockey fan, but the Rangers had, again, one good year, 79, because I missed the 72 year. So, but they had 79, and then that was really it until an adult. I certainly didn't grow up at the right time. I mean, the Yankees had the, you know, the Bronx Zoo years, but I was raised to hate the Yankees. I mean, my family are Brooklyn Dodger and New York Giants fans. So, I don't know what it was. I mean, my my dad was certainly a big baseball fan. My my uncle and my grandfather were were big all around sports fans. But I think I ended up being more of a sports fan than than any of them. It just was something that I guess you know I I kind of took my my dad and my mom's love of reading, and and my dad and my uncle and my grandfather's love of sports, and then kind of. My facility with numbers, I mean, I've always been very good with numbers and statistics, you know, so that when I was like seven years old, you could say, all right, if somebody went, you know, four for 14 in a three-game series, what's his batting average for that series? And I'd say, oh, 286, you know. Like, <laughs> so, and I kind of think it all came out in, to, you know, blended into this sort of thing, this person, this person who would sit down and spend two, almost two years writing a 500-page, four-and-a-half-pound book. It's a great book. Um, just for the people listening, you are listening on tcbradio.com and on terrestrial radio to Taking Care of Business. This is your host, Richard Solomon. I have Paul Solomon as my special co-host today. We're talking to Stuart Miller. And speaking of perfection, one of the things that you always see all the time on television, uh, Cooperstown, sports, uh, retro shows, whatever, is you know Yogi Berra running into Don Larson right. with a big bear hug, you know, uh, in the perfect game in the World Series in '56. Um, talk about that because that that's been sort of shown. Like like talk about like Lou Gehrig. That's also like another one of those very right. big moments. But what was interesting to me, you know, I, I, for me, I in, in each of these cases, I mean, I, I needed to find. You know, in a way, it's easier to write about the more obscure stuff. Because every you know, how many times have we written people have written about the ball through Buckner's legs or to Don Larson or to Lou Gehrig? So I, I, I needed to at least find something interesting and fresh about it. And what I discovered with the Don Larson game is that well, there are two things. One is that before that, people really in baseball didn't really distinguish between the perfect game and 
the no hitter in part because perfect games are so rare that only been a couple of them. But um, so, but so this really was a, a pivotal moment in terms of the way we distinguished between those two. But more importantly, I think was just that Larson actually won that game, even if he'd given up two hits in the ninth inning or two hits in the first inning. It was a huge game in terms of New York baseball history because what you had was the Dodgers had won the year before. Now, before that, you always figured, oh, the Yankees are going to find a way to win or the Dodgers will find a way to lose. That's just what happened. You know, and the Yankees win the World Series every year. 55, the Dodgers win. So now that aura is gone. 56, you, the, the Dodgers and Yankees split the first two games. You're going into game five, the the, John, the Dodgers are sending out Sal Magley, a great pitcher, a pitcher who knows how to win, a tough guy, a clutch guy. The Yankees are sending out this schmuck who who's, you know, doesn't pay attention. He's like, you know, wrapped himself around a, a, um, a lamppost driving drunk in spring training that year. He's not particularly dedicated. He's not what you think of as your, you know, World Series is on the line, Game 5 pitcher. And then the Game 6 and Game 7 year, they were going to have to go back to Ebbets Field, which is, you know, the Dodgers fared much better at home against the Yankees. So the, you expected at this point, before that game, you, you, you could really look at it and say, Magley's going to pitch well, Larson's going to get shelled the way he had earlier in the series. He'd gotten shelled. Larson will get shelled, the Dodgers will win, they'll go home, they'll, they'll win one of the last two games, and they'll be back-to-back champions. And you'll start to talk about a Dodger dynasty, and you won't think of the Dodgers as the, the same way as this team that was the kind of lovable bums who only won once. And it would have really changed the history of the Brooklyn Dodgers the way we know it and and the way we see those Yankees, that Yankee dynasty. And instead of that happening, this guy, Larson, who, again, had great stuff but was very erratic, comes out and madly pitched a great game. He only gave up two runs. But Larson was perfect. He, he threw three balls to Pee Wee Reese, the leadoff hitter. He'd always had control problems. Fell behind him. And then after that, didn't go to three balls and anybody else the entire game. Wow. You know, it's funny. Um, I, I'm flipping through the book as we're talking because it's just chock full of stuff. Again, for those who are just kind of wandering into the show, we're reading a book called The 100 Greatest Days in New York Sports by Stuart Miller, forward by Tom Terrific, Tom Seaver. Um, and one of the things I always talk about, I think about, is sort of the commercial on TV where John McEnroe goes, "Gotta be kidding me!" and he's just freaking out. Right, and, right. You know, talk. You have as number forty-five John McEnroe at the National Tennis Center, which is probably now known as the Arthur Ashe T- Tennis Center, rebuilt and stuff like that. But but talk about tennis, uh, the U.S. Open, and John McEnroe in general. Well, you know, it's funny because um, that match is, is a, a kind of a forgotten match. I mean, McEnroe is you know a, a New York native. He grew up in Queens and. Um, he had, the, you know, Connors had dominated the Open in, in from, you know, he'd won in 74, 76, 78, and he'd reached the finals in 75 and 77, and then Macro had come along and he'd won in 79. But, but the 80 title was, was hugely important because what people remember more is that summer in Wimbledon, Borg had won this historic five-setter, which went like 18, 16 in the fifth set. Borg had won, and it was you know like his fifth straight Wimbledon, and he kind of you know he was the greatest player you know in the sport, and kind of the way we see Federer today. And yet he had still not never won the Open, and so he kind of looked at this as his best chance to win the Open, and then he could kind of win the Grand Slam and become you know, fulfill his destiny. And McEnroe beat him in this great five setter, uh, and and the Queen's crowd is funny because again he was a native son McEnroe, but they'd always embraced. Connor's bad behavior more than than McEnroe. Why um, is that? You know, Connor's always first of all in the early days. Connor's Connor's had more critics. I mean, you know, his charm, what we think of, you know, his beloved, oh, you know, that stuff came later at, when he won in eighty two and eighty three as an older player, and then with his great run in ninety one. Um, but but even when but, but early on, at least with Connor's, you kind of got the feeling. That he was doing it with a wink and a nudge. That he that he was doing it to play to the crowd. McEnroe seemed like a spoiled kid who had lost his cool. And he, and he, oh, the other thing is that the Connors grew up in this kind of working class environment and had this very much me. You know, I've got to survive out there in this tough world, especially in this kind of elitist world of tennis. 
And Mackinac is from Douglaston, this gorgeous neighborhood in Queens, and kind of seemed like a spoiled rich kid or upper middle class kid, you know. I mean, so he couldn't quite pull it off, and and he didn't. When he was throwing a tantrum, I mean, there was never any of that humor um, that the Connors at least sometimes managed to convey. This kind of impish, mischievous, you know, which again Nastasi had as well. Um, and so I think that was a big thing. So this match was huge because I think, you know, it really kind of helped Macron establish himself on, on a number of different levels, and it really finished off Borg. Um, this was the end of the line for Borg, and then, you know, he, you know, Macron really surpassed him as the top player in the game the next year. Um, and, but it's interesting because um, at the back of the book, you know, I have this whole thing, I have um, worst moments in the back of the book, and then I have broken down by different sections. And one of the sections I have is bad behavior. And, um, you know, and that has everything from, you know, uh, Roger Clemens throwing the ball at, uh, um, at Mike Piazza's, at the bat at Mike Piazza's head in the World Series, to Rosie Ruiz cheating in the New York Marathon as a way to qualify so she could cheat in the Boston Marathon the way she, you know. <laughs> um, you know, so all those kinds of things. But I gave, I had to have two, there were two things I thought deserved their own separate categories. One was, the U.S. Open, specifically Nastasi, um, uh, Connors, and McEnroe, they, they had their top five, you know, worst outbursts. Um, one of which was Nastasi against McEnroe, one of which was Connors against Nastasi, um, and then the others, and one of which was Connors against McEnroe. So they, these guys all were kind of had their showmanship on high alert, um, you know, when they were against each other, particularly. Um, and then, of course, I had a separate category just for, for George Steinbrenner and Billy Martin because they deserve, you know, they had their top 20 bad behavior, uh, you know, for, for Billy Martin and George Steinbrenner. You couldn't even limit it to just a five. Wow. Now, let me ask this because this, the show is moving along at lightning speed. Yeah. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about the non humans like Secretariat? Sure. Talk, talk about that. Secretariat, you know, is a, that's an interesting one because. Um, one thing that people have to remember is that this book is, is about the five boroughs. So it's not the suburbs. So, you, so when the Giants and the Jets moved to the Meadowlands, that's not in there. Belmont is in Nassau County, so that's not in there. I have a I have a thing at the back, one page, top ten moments in the suburbs. And so the number one is Secretariat winning at the Belmont by 31 lanes, capping that glorious triple crown run. But, but Secretariat's moment in, in New York City, um, crowning moment should have been the wood. Memorial, which was the final tune-up before um, before the Kentucky Derby, Secretary actually ran that race with an abscess in his mouth and ran poorly, and was actually written off by a lot of experts after that. But the race before that, when it, when Secretary was healthy, was great because this was kind of a, a coming out. It really captured the national media's attention. Not only did Secretary, it was a mile-long run. Not only did Secretary win. You know, which is would have been nice, but um, but secretary, but but the horse did more than that. Uh, he he um, tied the track record, but even beyond that, his trainer was trying to get and, and jockey were trying to get the horse ready for the Kentucky Derby, which is a mile and a quarter. So they went they went right past the finish line and ran an extra quarter mile at full speed, and so at Aqueduct. They actually unofficially, but in that mile and a quarter, broke that what would have been the Derby record. So that was kind of a way of showing to the nation, hey, this horse is serious and this horse is for real. So, so you know, Secretary's kind of big national debut at at, uh, at Aqueduct. Uh, do you talk about the New York Marathon at all in here? Yeah, I have. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of there's half a dozen in the honorable mention, but there are three um, of them in the top 100. Uh, the the highest ranking one. Is the um, the first um, citywide New York Marathon? You know, the marathon um, in 1970 and, and through 1975 was just running in circles around Central Park, which I, you know, don't would not think would be you know I wouldn't find that particularly interesting. But by converting it into this you know fantastic, you know, it's now more than an athletic event. It's this citywide celebration, you know, and and it's a great day in New York City. So that's my. 25th highest, you know, it's so it made the top 25 because it's, it's truly a wonderful tribute to New York City. Now, now did Charles Conway get get in here? Uh, is uh, it, uh, <laughs> no, no. Hey, Charlie. Uh, but then there are two other uh, great marathon moments in the top 100. One is 
uh, Fred LeBeau, who you know was the founder of the marathon. When, we, when, we actually knew Fred LeBeau because a friend of ours was a friend of his. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, well, you know, he when he had cancer in his brain, and he all of a sudden he realized, hey, you know, he had run dozens of marathons. But he's like, I never ran the New York Marathon. And at this point, people are writing him off and thinking that he's going to die. He says, you know, I'm going to live, I'm going to beat this, and I'm going to run my marathon. And he did, and he ran it in 92 with Gretel Vates at, at you know, his side, and and it was kind of, it took him five hours and change to do it, but it was an amazing story, and it was a wonderful tribute, you know, to him. So so I have that one in there. And then further down near the bottom, I've got, um, there, there's this uh, Rod Dixon and Jeff Smith. There's this great moment, you know, it's one of these weird races where Smith led virtually the entire way. I mean, I think from after mile 11 on, literally led the entire way. And then in the last hundred yards, um, this guy, and this is and Rod Dixon passed him. This is after Salazar had won the three years in a row, and so um, this is the first year that anybody else, Salazar wasn't running, that anybody else was going to um, have a shot at it, really. And so Dixon passed him, and then it was captured in that great kind of agony, thrill of victory, agony of defeat moment of Dixon it just passed the finish line, arms to the sky, and the other guy laying on the ground, crumpled to the pavement, distraught, you know, not even making it to the finish line. Um, and so, so that's also in, in the top 100. Let, let me go back to our friend Rosie, who cheated in the marathon. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you talk about that? And how was she outed? You know, she wasn't outed in the New York one. I think you know what. Well, what happened was, first of all, in the Boston one, which you know, which is where she she won the Boston one, which is really what got her in a lot of trouble because. You know, finishing the New York Marathon by riding the subway. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's not that. It's I, not that big a deal because, um, you know, she finished twenty fourth among the women, and so it's like, you know, she jogged in, and nobody really, no really noticed it. But it was then after she, you know, it was kind of like a- after the Boston thing, they kind of went back and reviewed it and figured out that she had cheated here. And so they, they actually erased her from the record. You know, they, they invalidated her finish here as well. Um, and then she's, you know, been arrested for selling cocaine since then, and, you know, larceny and forgery charges. And, you know, so she's obviously a troubled person beyond just cheating the marathon. But, but what's amazing is that, you know, here you are sort of, you know, wearing marathon attire. On the subway. And, and you know, you kind of like, you know, you got you to have a Metro card or something. Well, that kind of was a token, but right, yeah. You know, or something like that. You know, you got to go in. the station, you're, what, do you just start running? Uh, really? Come out of the know. station and start running with the crowd? Yeah, I'm not quite sure how. I get, Well, you know, she did what she, she took the subway and. Uh, but how did she kind of blend back in by. Oh, because you know what she did was she, she waited. I mean, she was smarter. But I, I mean, from what I've read, she didn't mean to win the Boston Marathon. You know, she only wanted to finish and say, hey, look, I finished, kind of thing. And so in, in New York, what she did was she took the subway up to Manhattan, into Manhattan, up to Columbus Circle. And she went over to Central Park where they come, the crowds come in, and she just kind of melded into the pack. You know, like she, she, I guess, jogged in place and kept a little bit of a sweat going. And then when these people came in, she went in and she ran the last bit with them. So when she got to the finish line... She was sweating because, you know, she had run a little bit. Um, but I think what happened in Boston was she miscalculated, and so she ended up coming in ahead of everybody else. <laughs> like I was saying, I won? Oh, okay, I won, but not me. I don't think that was her plan. It's sort of like that movie, The Candidate with Robert Redford, where he runs for, you know, office, and then he wins, and he goes, well, what do I do now? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that actually happened in America. What happened in, in, in America? In 2000. Oh, <laughs> Let, let's let's talk a little bit about hockey because Paul and I lo- love hockey. Okay. You have here is number fifty one, the Rangers beating the Islanders to reach the Stanley Cup Finals in nineteen seventy nine. Could you talk about that? Yeah, it's funny. One of the things this book gave me an appreciation for, and you know, and it's it's hard um, to look back at the years where you didn't win it all, but. Um, it really gave me an appreciation for those years. Those teams that, that were great teams that may have, look, they, they lost in the Stanley Cup Finals. The Mets fell short in Game 7 against the Cardinals this year. The Giant, the Dodgers of 51 obviously didn't win the pennant the, the way the Giants did. Um, the Knicks with, with Ewing made it to the Finals but lost. But, but those teams, you know, they were still, if you could step back and look at it, that last triumph was still a great triumph. Uh, but in 
And so I tried to kind of pay homage to that. But, but of all those cases, you know, beating the Pacers is all well and good, or beating, you know, um, the, you know, the, the Giants beating the Phillies on the last day of the 51 season, that's fine. But to beat the Islanders to make it to the finals, well, that's something special because you're not, you're not just beating some other team. It's not beating the Blackhawks or any other team. It's beating the Islanders. And so, you know, it really just added that whole extra layer. Because imagine if they had lost to the Islanders. You know, the Islanders made it the next year. And, you know, so at least they staved them off by one year. Imagine if they had lost, how devastating that would have been for the Rangers. So that made that victory, I think, extra special. One of the things that I think that we've touched upon in this uh, show today is sort of the, the idea of rivalry. You know, you talked about that a, a little bit. But let's actually, like, really flesh this out. Are, could you talk a bit about the great rivalries between either New York teams or whatever that go way back? You know, there's always, like, Army, Navy, and you talk about... Well, what it, we've had is, we had is, is Notre Dame Army. We had, you know, uh, we didn't have Army, Navy here for the most part, but we had Notre Dame Army um, started up at West Point, and then they became so popular that those games are free, and they're like, hey, we can make money off of this. Let's move it to the city. And, you know, they started off at... Actually, the first year they had to play at Ebbets Field because the Giants and Yankees were having... 1923, we're using the polo bounds. But then 1924, which is, you know, when Grantland Rice wrote about um, the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame, that was at the polo grounds. And by 1928, the year of the win-win for the Gipper game, that had moved, to, they moved to Yankee Stadium, and they stayed there, they played every year there until 1946, which was the battle of the century, this great rivalry between these teams that had been battling each other for decades, and now both of them, after the war, were undefeated, and they played to a 0-0 standstill. That's one great rivalry that I think people don't think of the way we automatically think of, oh, the Dodgers and the Giants and the Dodgers and the Yankees, um, and, and obviously the Rangers and the Islanders. You know, I think another um, thing that, that, you know, I have in the book, um, obviously in tennis, you know, there, there was McEnroe and Connors, McEnroe and um, Borg. You know, there were some great rivalries like that. There's Sampras and Agassi and um Ellis and Graf to a lesser extent, but really Sampras and Agassi I have in there. Um, but also boxing. Um, and obviously, to a large extent, these rivalries didn't entirely play out here in New York. But you've got um, Lewis Schmeling, you know, classic. Yeah. Ali Frazier um, is, is the ultimate, and, and their first fight was, you know, the, the, the fight at the Garden. Um, but going back further in time, you had. Um, and, and to a uh, oh, wait till people don't remember, but you had um, Willie Pep and Sandy Sadler. Willie Pep uh, j- just died last year, but he was considered you know one of these pound for pound you know maybe not quite Sugar Ray Robinson, but, but right up there. And you know Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake LaMotta, they fought. Their first fight was at the Garden. You know their most famous fight was in Chicago, but their first fights were here in New York. Um, so you have Sugar Ray and, and LaMotta. You have you know so there's a lot of in boxing. There's a lot of these great rivalries. Um, that, that play themselves out on, on the New York stage. And, uh, you know, then, you know, there were rivalries that um, New York teams had with with other non-New York, to, you know, with other, you know, like the, the Giants and the Bears had a great rivalry, you know, back in the days when, when the NFL was smaller, you know, and, and the, you know, they were fighting for the NFL championship every year or, you know, or a lot of years. So, yeah, you had rivalries like that. Yeah, you're right. I think, you know, it's not something that I was conscious of to, to a large extent, but, um, but but it certainly is a theme that runs throughout the book. The Nick, Knicks and Lakers in the early 70s was, I remember that. you know, yeah. two, two finals in, in, in a very short span. So, Let, let's do, I mean, three finals, actually. The Knicks lost one. The Knicks won two of them, but they played three finals in a four-year span. So. Not, there's nothing like controversy for either the news or sports. So I gotta go to the five worst days, okay? Because because the that's always good. Yeah. Um, you have the number one worst day. The Dodgers <laughs> saying we're out of here. Right. I, I, there are people to this day who still talk about that. Right, and you know it's uh, I forget who it was, but you know there's there's some great line from some writer about you know oh if I uh, you know about kind of it's actually lumping O'Malley in with. Um, Hitler and Stalin, but you know, kind of, <laughs> but, but, kind of, but kind of giving Hitler and Stalin the benefit of the doubt, you know. <laughs> and you know, it, it's one of these things that, uh, that look, the Giants left at the same time, but they they didn't have the same sense of identity, and and plenty of teams 
have moved. I mean, you know, the Braves moved from Boston to Milwaukee, but it, you know, and then to Atlanta. But it didn't. It it's not the same thing. Um, there, there are very few examples. You know, you know, the St. Louis Browns moving to Baltimore. Even even in other sports, when you know the Baltimore Colts picked up and left, they they, they, they don't quite have the same hold as I mean, because Brooklyn was part of a larger city and yet had its own identity, and it was a weird thing because at that time. The Brooklyn Eagle, which was its hometown daily paper, which still exists, yeah. Well, no, but now it exists in a more modified form. But it folded that year; it had just folded, or a year before that. Um, so there was this real sense that Brooklyn was undergoing change, and there was this big white flight to the suburbs, and so it was really a kind of a turning point for the borough. Um, yeah, that one was kind of an easy one to pick, and number two was pretty easy to pick, which was you know the CCNY point shaving scandal, which was a huge, again, a national. Um, story. For those who don't know, talk about that, and because this is a national show, uh, could you tell them who CCNY actually was? Sure. CCNY, the City College of New York, um, had, and or they're actually, it's a funny thing, because they're in the worst days, but they're, the, the same squad is in the top 15, you know, in the top 100 list, because in 1950, they kind of came from nowhere. They had struggled all season, which it turns out we now know is because they were shaving points and they lost a couple of games <laughs> But where they they got a little carried away with it, you know. But but they were a young team that year. They had a lot of sophomores, and they went on to win the NIT when it was the main tournament, and the NCAA in the same year. They won them two you know weeks apart. They won two national championships, which no one has ever done. And of course now you can't do it. But um, but so they were the, the ultimate in college basketball. They were the powerhouse. And then the next year, these guys got arrested for shaving points. And everybody else, you know, Adolph Rupp out of Kentucky said, oh, those city kids, you know, that, that Madison Square Garden's a den of iniquity, you know, you wouldn't find my players doing that. And of course, you know, within weeks, the, the scandal had reached out to um, to Kentucky as well, and they were Kentucky players. And there were players all across the country that were implicated in this. But the reality is that it was, you know, CCNY and LIU and all these city powerhouses, NYU, and a lot of them either gave up basketball completely or, or kind of really – you know, shrank their their basketball program, so it it transformed New York's basketball presence. And the, ironically, the one school that stayed clean in that was the one that remained a major powerhouse was St. John's. Wow. Let me ask you: How were they discovered? In the how 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 did the scandal get discovered? How did the story break? Well, you know, I, I mean, it's one of these things where I I think a lot of people knew that. Um, that this was going on. I mean, the gambling, you know, these guys were in the stands. And it was, it was, it was more just a matter that they were going after, the, you know, the, the district attorneys and stuff were going after these guys. And they got a guy from Manhattan College um, to to kind of to come in. And then, you know, or maybe he got turned in by somebody else. But, you know, it was one of these things that then it just spread. Ah, he flipped. Yeah. You know, and, and, yeah, they flipped one, then they... Flipped another, and then, you know, next thing you know, like I said, it's Kentucky and LIU and Bradley and, you know, half, and virtually the, all the stars from CCNY. So, and then, of course, it came out that not only were they shaving points, but, and, and it shaved points in their championship season, but that a, the assistant coach had doctored transcripts to ensure eligibility while the coach was blind, you know, turning a blind eye to that, you know, so it was kind of went beyond, beyond that. So, kind wow. of a. Fascinating. Yeah. We, we, we only have like five minutes left, but pause the question. Yes, with the few minutes that we have left, and as a fan of the esoteric, I'd like to know what would you uh, talk about uh, in the book concerning like the minor sports, like say soccer or WHL or ABA? There's no uh, WHL or ABA. There, there, you know, there was none of that stuff in, in the city, really. I mean, the Nets were a Long Island team. Um, there, there's in the back in that one page I talked about, there is that. The suburbs, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, in soccer, you know, Pele's debut is the is makes the honorable mention, but that's about it. My my favorite of the the, um, the esoteric sports. I mean, I mean, I don't know if you're counting like Carl Lewis's jump. I mean, track and field is kind of second tier at this point, or third tier. You know, I mean, that's in there, and you know, there are things like that. But my favorite is number one hundred on my list. Uh, you know, the bottom of the top one hundred, number one hundred, is the last of the solo six day bike races. There are a lot of people that have heard of the bike races, the six-day bike races, because they existed. They were very popular in the 20s and 30s, kind of when they had the dance marathons, too. 
Um, but those were two team, two person teams, because they'd outlawed the, the solo ones because they were so people were getting injured and literally going crazy because their managers would keep you out on your bike nonstop. But the last event of uh, of this was held in 1898, and uh, there was a, a guy, Charles Miller, who was the defending champion, and he set out to break his record. And on the last day, he bro- and they knew it was being outlawed. They knew this was the grand finale. This guy, in, in the 142 hours of the race, he was only off his bicycle for 15 hours total. He only slept for nine and a half hours in, wow. a, you know, in a six-day span. He would eat while pedaling, so it was just not to give up any time. You know, the, his manager would bring him out food, and he'd sit down, he'd pedal and eat and pedal and eat. Um, and most of these guys would do that, and, then they, and their manager would keep them out there until they'd, you know, their ankles would snap or they'd get dizzy and fall off, and that's why they outlawed it. But so Miller... Had this amazing stamina, and by the last day, it becomes apparent that he's got a big enough lead, and he's going to break his record. So not only does he that happen, oh, and you got to remember that these guys are pedaling away in Madison Square Garden back when smoking was legal. So there's like a thick haze of smoke, and you're biking through it. So, but the promoters know that this guy's engaged, and they say to him, "Listen, you've got a big enough lead. Will you get married here at the Garden?" So he says, "Sure." So in the middle of the race, he builds up his lead, builds up his lead, and then leaves the track. His wife wanted him to put on like a suit or a tux, but he instead came out with this very elaborate bike suit with different colors and an eagle and a flag sewn into it, embroidered into it and stuff. And he comes out in the middle of the race, and it goes over to the box where his wife is sitting, and they have this big ceremony. So this, you know, it's like a great PR stunt. Um, and they get married, and the crowd goes crazy, and you know, pictures are taken, and... They pay him an extra 300 bucks, which back in 1898 was a lot of money. Then he goes back, changes, and then he gets back on his bike and finishes the race. And then they go out to the Waldorf Astoria for dinner afterwards. That's wild. Yeah, so that's my favorite of the esoteric ones. Okay, we're, we're kind of winding down. We have about three minutes to go, maybe about two and a half. So I want to make sure I get all the contact information before we kind of get squeeze a little bit more trivia out of you because this has been a, you've been a phenomenal guest with great information. Uh, tell us about all your books. Sure. Well, you've got The Other Islands of New York City, which, as I said, I co-wrote with my wife, Sharon Seitz, and The Blue Guide to New York, which I co-wrote with her. We did the third edition. There was two previous ones, but we made it a much, much better book because it uh, was very Manhattan-centric. We explored all the boroughs. We had a lot of pop culture. It had been written by this older woman who wouldn't have known you know, places like I mean, CBGB's doesn't exist anymore, but things like that that we added in. Um, then uh, my wife wrote a book called Big Apple Safari for Family about exploring nature in New York, and I went off and wrote a book about the New York Giants called Where Have All Our Giants Gone, um, which was 40 interviews with 40 former Giants who played for the team from the 40s up through the early 80s, ending with um, Brad Van Pelt. And then this book, uh, The 100 Greatest Days in New York Sports. This is the only one that I have a website for. It's the 100greatestnysports.com. And it's, uh, like I said, you, you know, you get any of these books on Amazon, but if you go to, if you're on the site, you can click directly to Amazon to buy the book, but you can also click on there to write to me. I'll tell you, th- these are phenomenal books, and, you know, we're holding them in our hands. And I'll tell you, these, you know, not to be too shameless here, but these, these would make great gifts um, for people who love either New York, New York history, New York trivia, uh, New York sports. I mean, th- th- this 100 greatest uh, days of New York sports. If you know somebody out there who loves sports, I mean, this is like something that is like the greatest book to have. Put on the coffee table. And, yeah, you know. it's great. It's funny because it was, it was around holidays, you know, around the holidays. Everybody's saying, "Oh, I've got because that's when it came out. I'm going to buy this for my dad or my brother." Or, you know, and it was a great present. Now I'm thinking it's the same thing. You know, Valentine's Day, you know, for boyfriends or husbands, it's kind of that great thing. And then it'll be Father's Day, you know. And again, it's that it's that great, you know, gift for like you said. I mean, who doesn't love? Who doesn't want to read about? You know whether it's boxing or tennis or baseball. I mean, it's all in here. So, In, in, our, in our last 30 seconds, do you have any future books that you're working on? I've got some ideas that I'm, I'm you know, talking about and thinking about, but nothing firm enough, you know, right this minute that uh, right now I'm working on some articles and uh, possibly looking into making a, a documentary series out of this book, like a 12-part countdown show of the 100 Greatest Days in New York Sports, where we'd have panels on to debate, you know, so you'd have, like, a panel with, like, Willis Reed and John McEnroe and Marv Albert and myself and, you know, debating. And then the next week you'd have a different panel of different celebrities. You'd have, like, Spike Lee and, you know, you know, uh, 
I don't know, you know, different, but different athletes. Hate to tell you this, but we're out of time. Well, but I'll tell you this: we want to have when you write your next book, we'd love to have you back. Okay, sounds All right. great. This is Richard Solomon and Paul Solomon. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week again. This is Stuart Miller, our guest. We'll see you in a week. Thanks.